Super welcome back for session two of CE 120B, 220B. You're welcome. Some folks are just joining us for the first time today. Uh, today we are going to like uh, just start diving into the whole notion of building systems design and how we integrate them together. Today we're going to talk specifically about the whole issue of like context. And before we actually get into a lot of designing the active systems, it's really all about trying to understand, you know, for any individual site, um, for any individual design program, how we would approach the whole design process, because there's a lot of complexity ahead, and before we dive into all of the complexity, it really is helpful to kind of have a high level, just kind of roadmap of where we're going, and what's going to be important to us, and what isn't so important to us, to find that some things are certainly much more impactful than others. Okay, so as we get going today, I'm going to start by just talking about your building sites. And some of us have the sites already kind of in mind, others haven't yet. But for any site, how we would go ahead and take a look at the site and understand what sort of things it brings us, what sort of natural features we could take advantage of versus uh, things we're going to have to compensate for. And then we'll get more into um, specifically how we can use some of the design tools to find out information about that, test some early assumptions. I want to finish up today just sort of talking about the whole integrated design project and just sort of what people are thinking about doing as that project. Because, you know, one of the first things you have to do is to sort of choose what it is that you are interested and enthused in trying to do some design work on. For some people, it will be the Sustainable Design Center project that we've used in the past. For other people, I know there's different ideas. So we just want to get some of them up there, help everyone sort of scope it out and think about how you could approach that problem. Okay. So let me start out this first with the whole notion of how we're approaching design because I think that's important to sort of get out of the way right up front. So these are oh, those fundamental axioms that sort of guide our thinking as we go through all this. Um, there is a whole notion that as we go through and think about systems for new building, especially thinking about the mechanical systems, that whenever possible, if we can do something that takes advantage of just the passive features of the site, the features that are already there and naturally available to us, as opposed to putting a lot of mechanical equipment that's power driven, that would be better to go ahead and use those natural features. It's almost always better, you know, it's, it's hard to fight with nature. We sort of got into fighting with nature oh, early or kind of in the middle of the last century when air conditioning came on the scene and it was considered to be socially desirable to have air conditioning, it was a mark of status to be able to cool your place and be able to kind of have a very moderate temperate climate no matter where you were. We sort of thought that energy was infinite. We thought that maybe with nuclear power or just some sort of energy sources, we could just burn energy and there'd be no impact to it. So we designed all sorts of things that really almost ignored or worked against the environment. It was almost a matter of pride to see how you could do that. We've since discovered, or since really reawakened to the fact that really <coughs> some of the older designs are really the most sustainable. Even if you go back and you look at something like the old Stanford Quad with the heavy stone construction, the tile roofs, the shaded arcades, the deep set windows, there's a lot of features that we'd say are very highly desirable, sustainable design features. Okay, and it was largely out of necessity. And necessity is always kind of a good thing. If you really start with the notion of not being able to power your way out of things, you have to come up with good designs. So we're often going to be thinking about uh, passive systems first. We're also going to be thinking about performance-based design. And the idea here, we talked about it a little bit last time, is that rather than doing our design work in a vacuum and then just assessing what the impact of the performance would be, it's good to start out with a target in mind and really be focusing on that target. That you don't do all your design work and just accept those results as an outcome but that you do your design work really focusing towards the target and then based on how the results are coming back, you know, adjusting to try to come closer and closer to that target. And this is something that really only became readily available to us with the power of all the computing technology we could have on our desktop and put in our hands. Honestly, for many years, it was impossible. It was just too much work to do a very thorough energy analysis or a very thorough cost analysis. People sort of saved it till the end, and you crossed your fingers and hoped for the best. But you certainly weren't going to go back and change anything, because that would just be too much work. Okay. Whereas now, even from square one, we have the ability to get some very quick feedback. It may not be highly precise, but we at least have a range. And as we keep on going further and further with the detail, 
we get more precise answers, and hopefully we're, we're honing in on a target as opposed to shooting in the dark. Okay. A third thing I want you to think about as we're doing all this stuff is just be aware of and always think about the time frame we're looking at because it's going to give you very different answers about whether you're thinking about sort of a single day in the life of a building, a total year in the life of a building, or even the project lifetime. You'll tend to get different sort of answers because a lot of what we're going to do is really dependent on climate conditions and how we are relative to the climate. So if I gave you a day in December versus a day in July, you get very different answers in terms of what needs to be done. Okay? It's often much more fair to think about a year in the life. Hopefully that sort of averages out across the year. But almost more important is to think about the overall project lifetime. Because a lot of what we do may have an impact on the early costs of the project, okay, but will pay off over the much longer time. So it's often not fair just to look at a single year. It's often much better to look at sort of a payback period, how many years. For example, if you're doing solar panels, you know, a good way to think about that is just how many years it would take to pay off for those solar panels. It probably isn't going to be in one or two years. It's going to be over more like 15 or 20 years or something like that. So it gets into really thinking about the life of the project, about whether that's worthwhile to pursue. But even then, we'll defer back to principle one, which says, and before we go ahead and slap a lot of solar panels all over the building and try to basically gain energy, it might be better to think about how we could save energy so we don't need to put those panels on and get the cost in the first place. Okay, so just some general design things to think about. As we dive on in, I'm gonna start with just, you know, before we get into the detailed design, just really focus on the whole issue of just doing some analysis and planning. Really, this is definitely one of those cases where a little bit of work up front goes a long way towards just sort of understanding the problem that you're trying to solve before you start diving right into a solution. And as they say in real estate, it's, I think it's true for building design too, it's all location, location, location. Everything sort of ends on location because it just makes a huge difference where these buildings are located. And what really comes out of location more than anything is an understanding of hopefully what problems need to be addressed. Because if I were talking to you, well actually talking about Palo Alto and our foothills here is actually kind of, it's not a very interesting problem because in a lot of ways, we have a very moderate climate. We have a very sort of temperate climate that at some level, if I put you out in a tent on the Palo Alto foothills or something like that, there'll be a couple nights that are pretty cold and a couple days that are too warm. But for the most part, you could probably pretty much survive in our natural environment pretty easily. It's really not that bad. It's very different if I put you in Buffalo, New York, or if I put you in Dubai, or I put you all sorts of places where there's much larger temperature extremes, and that's what we have to watch out for, is really just kind of thinking about the location and really ultimately what sort of things happen there. Because what happens is as we start to choose a project location, you know, we definitely get a latitude and longitude, which affects how the sun is moving through the sky and how bright it's going to be at different times of the year. But we also get things like a temperature profile. So the whole idea of how warm it's going to be and when it exceeds our comfort zone and how cold it's going to be is very important to sort of understand. Let's get to get into this next part about planning for comfort. But understanding what the temperature is tends to be very important. Location also affects just the whole notion of daylight and light and shadow. So how are shadows being cast? Where is light hitting the building? Is that doing things that are sort of very beneficial for us, like providing daylighting? Or is it actually providing a lot of heat? Because solar radiation is really an incredibly powerful heat source. And if you're not looking for heat, it's something that you actually want to shield yourself against. So we're going to find that most of these different forces have a positive side and a not so positive side. It really depends what you're trying to do. The wind can be a fantastic cooling force, which is really, really nice on a warm summer day. It can be an incredibly chilling force, or even a dangerous force, you know, when it's uh, not so welcome. So, but then again, if I was trying to power some wind turbines, I might like that wind. But what we're going to find for all these things, the wind, the rainfall, all these things, it's all related to the site. And every site, you have to look at it a little bit differently. 
Another issue that people don't think about very much, but that does affect this whole equation is just the surrounding. It's not just like a planet on the Earth. You're actually surrounded by something. So different things to think about, you know, that ground you're located on is sort of very important because that ground is actually sort of a really nice either heat sink or heat source, depending how you want to look at it. But it maintains a nice constant temperature. But even the topography and what's around you affects the performance where you are. In that if we went ahead and put you all on the cliffs near the beach where you're very exposed to the weather, okay, you have a very different response to the climate conditions versus being in a very tight urban environment. So if you were in downtown Hong Kong or if you were in downtown New York City, something like that, you know, even though the temperature may fluctuate quite a bit and the wind may go blowing, you may be so insulated from everything because of all the surrounding buildings and just the thermal mass that's built up all around you, you really don't really feel the effect nearly as much. So we often sort of also look at the issue of just the density of what's around you because that will sort of temper what we're doing. Okay, it all kind of comes down to, at some level, planning for comfort. So here's the deal when it comes to thinking about building systems. Not so much the structural systems, but thinking about the mechanical systems and all the things that typically consume a lot of energy. You know, it's all about just really trying to keep people comfortable. Okay, a lot of what we do in terms of the power consumption, let's start with that. Okay, so for buildings, as you think about buildings, you know, where does the power go into a building? Start with your assumptions about that. So if you look at all the power that's going into buildings right now, and we sort of divided it up against all the different things that it was going into, what's the single biggest consumer? Do you have any sense? Or what are some of the things that consume power? And we'll sort of rank them. What do you got? Lighting. Is that? Lighting. Light is definitely a big one. Okay. So. Temperature control tends to be another big one. Any other big ones? No, not really. <laughs> That's sort of it. <laughs> so in the scheme of things, you know, it'll vary a little bit depending on the local climate. But it almost always goes like temperature control and then lighting. But they're often close. You know, you're looking at 30 to 40 on each of those or something like that. But when you get on down to things like the plug loads and things like the equipment and stuff like that, it's really much lesser. It's not negligible. There's an awful lot we can do to improve the efficiency of our buildings by putting in high efficiency fixtures that consume a lot less on all these different sort of plug loads. Even on lighting, things like switching to LED lighting as opposed to these lights which generate heat is really a very, very good strategy. But if we think about overall where the energy is going, most of it sort of uh, goes into these things. These are sort of the big consumers that are actually uh, kind of driving things. Okay. So this is for electricity. The other side of the equation is usually fuel. And that could be oil, that could be uh, coal, that could be any sort of other things, although a lot of what we do tends to get converted into electricity. But in terms of fuel, what's the biggest consumer of that? Is that? Oh, fuel, um, like. In buildings. Oh, heating. Yeah, it's just heating. It's quite clearly heating. So we say that's almost all going into heating. A little bit of it goes into water heating. But at least in terms of the big drivers, the big demand drivers, those are the big guys right there. So let's think about how this all plays out relative to what you want to do. So we have these sorts of things demanding sort of fuel and demanding energy. Okay, we need to go through and like address ultimately of keeping people comfortable because what you want to do we can build a building that's kind of okay but in order to sort of exist in the building and use the building we have to sort of have a couple different things it has to be you know bright enough so that you can actually uh, do whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing in there typically you'll also want it to be comfortable enough okay where that's a very subjective thing okay well, let's talk about that and like how we can think about it I'm gonna go switch it on over here. And we'll think about just the whole notion of your comfort and what it means relative to a building. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw an axis over here. That's for time. 
I'm going to draw another axis over here. That'll be temperature. Okay, so let us think about this. Who's my victim for today? How about Gustavo? So, let's talk about your comfort zone. I think you say what. <laughs> See, I chased Marvelies away. She's never coming back. <laughs> okay, so in terms of being comfortable, let's think about your temperature. So, if you're hanging around here in this building, you're wearing a nice sweater today. So it's a little chilly in here, all that kind of stuff. How warm can you get into here in before you start feeling like, oh, you know, I'm just feeling a little bit too warm for comfort. Yeah, I'm gonna start just wishing I wasn't in the room. So how hot is that temperature? Uh, I want to say like 80 degrees. Okay. No worries. This is one of those ones, there's no right and wrong to this because you're going to find that it's actually cultural. It's really everyone based on where you are and all sorts of assumptions, where you were raised, has their own little range. It's a little bit different, although we're, we're fairly similar, but it's a little bit different depending on like, all sorts of things about how you're raised. How about how cold do you get? How cold are you willing to sit around here before you're like, oh, I, I'm really just a little bit too cold, i got to get a coat. Okay, you're pretty tolerant of the scheme of things. So great, I got this upper and this lower. Okay, so theoretically the idea is, as long as I can keep the temperature between these two extremes, you're gonna be happy. Okay, now, you're probably even happier <laughs> somewhere in here, okay, but you're tolerable. Because what'll happen is between this level and that level, you might put on a sweater or a sweatshirt or something like that. Up here, you know, maybe you're stripping off your sweatshirt or something like that. But there's sort of a range that's considered uncomfortable. Okay, so let's think about a couple different things relative to this. Let's think about our climate and what's happening outside there. So, on a typical, oh, let's think about a winter day like today. So like, you know, how cold did it get last night? Anyone know? It wasn't actually all that bad. It was a little colder last week or something like that. How cold does it get to here in the wintertime? Mid 50s. Mid 50s? I'll go with that. It actually gets a little colder sometimes. That's good. So at night, the temperature is somewhere around here. How hot's it going to get today? High 60s. High 60s? Okay, not too bad. It'll go on up through the day, and it'll start dropping back down again. Probably repeat that cycle tomorrow. Super. How about, let's think about the summertime. What's happening in the summertime? So let's say you're here in July, like that. How hot does it get during the day here? Yeah. Okay, so the peak is probably somewhere up here. And at night, it's kind of in there. Yeah, it's actually pretty good. Okay, super. So here's the deal. If we just camped you out on the Sanford Quad in a tent, okay, with no heating or cooling or something like that, you would feel these temperatures, okay? And you'd feel comfortable here, you'd be a little bit cold, or you'd be comfortable here, you might be a little hot during the day. Okay, not too bad. What we tend to think of is this zone down in here at the bottom. Okay. In the world of buildings, is that's considered heating time. Because whenever it's naturally kind of colder than we'd like it to be, what we gotta do is introduce some sort of heat to the situation trying to keep you up within the, the heating, the, the, the comfort zone. Similarly, during the summertime, back up in here, it's probably getting a little bit too warm. So we think of those as being cooling times. Okay? And that's where we're using the energy, is it's in these times and in that time, whether it's fuel use or it's electricity use. Okay be somewhere there. Now, it's not quite so simple because 
We are sitting up there in the quad. Okay, I'm naturally exposed to these things. So we got a lot of building around us. Okay, and the building, well, it's not perfectly insulative. Okay, it does insulate us a lot from the outside environment. Okay, but the effect of the building tends to be that as the temperature swinging up and down, the temperature inside the building is lagging behind somewhat. Because what sort of happens is, oh, when it starts getting warm, well, what do I want to say? It's, it's over time. Like, it'll probably never get quite as hot as it is out there, and it'll probably never get quite as cold as it is in there. The building always sort of lags a little bit. And the reason it lags is if the windows were open, it wouldn't lag. Okay, but if the windows are there, basically the heat or the cold has to either flow through a wall surface or flow through a window surface, and that just slows things down. So it's just a little bit slow on the response. The other thing that happens when the building is really kind of cool or really nice is buildings have this thing called thermal mass. So the floors being made of concrete in our building or the stone walls on the outside. They're kind of nice because even when the sun sets at night, they've been warmed up by the solar radiation through the day, so they sort of re-radiate slowly. So you can sort of think of it like a big battery. It's a big battery that stores heat, it's a big battery that stores cold. So it just tends to lag it a little bit. So it's a little bit easier in the building to go ahead and try and stay within that zone. But we're still sort of playing around with this whole issue of just trying to keep you within that zone. So every site has slightly different conditions. This is Palo Alto. Palo Alto is a very you know, you know, comfortable place. Okay. Let's think about a hot place. Where's the hottest place? Like second shy, where, where's a hot place? I think of a lot of places in Asia that are very hot. <laughs> Singapore is pretty hot, okay. Although Singapore is actually amazingly constant. So tell, tell me about Singapore. What's the temperature profile like there? Okay, so about how much Celsius? Um, 20 to 35. Okay, 20 to 35. So 35 is like around 100. 20 is, what's that, like 70 or something like that? You know, it's 75 or something. I'm very bad on, that's the one thing I can't convert. I get all sorts of different things. But it stays generally warmer. 68. 68. Okay, so in Singapore, the range is going to be up in here. So in Singapore, when that weather goes swinging around, and it's actually amazingly constant. It doesn't change that much through the year. Okay. You, know, you can see that most of the time, Singapore rarely has a heating problem. <laughs> Singapore almost always has a cooling problem. Okay, so they're there. If I switched it around, instead I went to, oh, somewhere up in Alaska or northern Canada, it'd be the other extreme. So location makes a big difference in terms of really what you're after, in terms of whether it's heat or cold. So, and yeah, just to sort of consider it. Okay. Just leave it there. Yeah, actually, I'll show you how we actually get precise numbers for all these things. But let's talk about this in terms of passive versus active. In the active world, where everything was always uh, just completely enclosed, and we have full air conditioning and full heating, the deal is whenever we are outside this comfort zone, or whenever the temperature, well, there's the outside temperature. I should also go for what the inside temperature is. The idea is when it is actively kind of heated and cooled, it, what happens is it happened with a lot of buildings that had sealed windows. Well, big office buildings are that way. Okay. When at nighttime the temperature starts dipping down again and we no longer uh, <coughs> temperature starts dipping down again, but we are no longer needing to cool, since the building's kind of lagging, even though the outside temperature got cool, we would continue to run the air conditioning. Okay? Because we're just not taking advantage of the natural temperature. Or here, the thing that happens is, even on these winter days, if I seal up the building, okay, and it's warmer outside than it was warmer inside the building, okay, we might actually do well just opening the windows and letting the natural ventilation kind of take care of things because we get the heat without having to go through and run it through a heater system. Like that. So, you know, even in these sorts of scenarios, we have the ability to sort of play with active versus passive. And really what you're seeing in a lot of buildings now, if you look at the white and redo building, for example, 
there's a really big effort to go through and try to take advantage of the natural forces. There's thermal mass. That's why we have all this concrete everywhere that's left exposed, because we want to sort of feel the temperature effect of that. There's radiant heating in it that's providing the heating we need. There's also some chilled beams, which are basically going ahead and providing sort of some surge heating or cooling as necessary, because radiant's kind of slow and steady and very efficient, but it may not be fast enough acting to keep us comfortable. So we have the chilled beams to supplement that. But even more importantly than that is the way the whole building's designed. The way the windows are located, the light shelves are located, and even on most of the windows is the whole notion that they open and close based upon what the temperature differential is, so that it's trying to take advantage of the natural forces. Or even kind of a very dramatic thing that happens here in Y282, if you're ever here, and I hope you aren't, at like two in the morning or whenever it happens, it's sometime like that, the top of all the skylights, those atriums, open up. And it's, it's, it's like a vacuum. The, the air goes rushing up through those, and it does a thermal flush of the building, okay, which makes it cool and nice for us in the morning. It releases all that heat. But it's really quite strong, because just the effect of the temperature rising and that pulling the air through, it really, it'll pull things off the desk. It's really very strong. So if you're ever here late at night, you're wondering where that breeze is coming from. Open the okay, so enough of all that. Let's go back over to here. Where do I want to be? Yeah. yeah. There's this really this notion of really what is comfortable. And it all sort of starts with that. And then ultimately, what problems need to be addressed? So, for example, let's talk about this, because we're going to get this in relative to the whole notion of maximizing the natural forces. Let me do this. Hang on. Oh, get another uh, victim here. Where's my Google Earth? One of the sites that we're looking at is, oh, it's essentially up here in the dish. Yep, in Stanford Dish, or there's one over at Jasper Ridge. Either one would be fine. Let me go ahead and just kind of take a look at the site for a minute so you can sort of see what we have in mind. Here's Jasper Ridge. If I can find the lake. There's the lake. The site that we actually have for the design center, if you're interested, is right over here and by the lake. See if I can orbit that up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so here's the idea. So here we are, we're hanging out. Picture yourself here. <laughs> okay, so who's my victim? That sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brittany. Okay, so here you are. We just dropped you down at the Jasper Ridge site. It's really a nice site. You got a lovely view of the lake. We're going to drop you down there at 8 in the morning. We'll let you keep your backpack, all that kind of stuff. You're hanging there, and I want you just to sit there. Okay, so it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and things are feeling pretty good. It's 9 o'clock. You're getting kind of bored, so you read a book. It's 10 o'clock. Yeah, temperature's rising a little. Okay, but yeah, as you think about the situation of being out there, you know, what's going to get to you first? That's really the question. Okay, what's going to be the first thing that's going to bother you? Because what I'm going to try and do is, prioritize what problems we need to take care of, okay, based on, because the natural environment's pretty good. I'd love to sit out there in the natural environment, but it's a little harsh, so what's going to bother you first? I don't know, I tend to get cold, so I think like earlier in the morning, if it weren't warm yet, I would feel chilly. Okay. So we need a little bit of uh, cold, so we need some sort of uh, insulation of some type. Yeah. 
how could we go ahead and start bringing in like a, some sort of heating for you of some type, some active heating? How can we sort of like uh, help you out there? Just from getting so cold. Ah, okay, no, blankets are good. Okay, so just generally insulation and stuff like that's always good. So great, we're gonna wrap you up in a little bit of uh, <laughs> insulation. Okay, super. Jacket over here, there we go. Okay, anything else we could do for you out there? That's you bringing your own stuff. Do you think we could do relative to the site that would actually help out? Like if, if you were an animal out there, like how, how do they keep from getting cold at night? Mm. I'll try to burrow somehow. Why did I like to burrow? What's going on with that? Isn't the ground usually more temperate than the air? Yeah, the ground keeps a very fantastic, relatively constant temperature. Do you know, do you know what the temperature of the ground is? It's, it's very close to what you actually, it's usually within the comfort range. It'll be like 60 some odd degrees or something. It's, it's some really comparatively nice temperature. So when it is like 80 degrees at noon time, Okay, the ground stays still pretty comfortable. When it's 30 degrees at night, the ground stays pretty comfortable. So the idea of burrowing is actually sort of a really good sort of way to approach this. Okay, so if you just think about the ground and your relationship to the ground, carving out or somehow protecting yourself with the ground is a really good way of kind of keeping a really nice constant temperature. Okay, relative to what's changing with a big fluctuating uh, kind of temperature profile of what's happening just due to the sun and stuff like that. That seems good. What else do they? Let's say they keep you warm. You're sitting out there. What, what, what's going to bother you next? Ah, the sun's a big one. It's funny. For me, it's the opposite. I'll, I'll actually have more trouble with the sun first, but you can sort of see why that is. I don't have much protection. Okay, so the sun tends to be a big deal. We gotta keep you out of the sun because just being in direct sun, as much as it feels great on a summer day when you're out there tanning at the beach and you're feeling really good, there are times when it just gets to be a little bit too intense. Okay, so boy, the sun's kind of hanging around in there. What do we do about the sun? What can we do for you there? Ah, okay. So a little bit of shade would be nice. What could we do? We could move you under a tree. That might be the easiest thing. Let's say we couldn't do that. What else could we do? Um, sure. Some sort of shelter would be nice. A little shelter over you. Excellent. Okay. The sun's up. If we have the sun sort of taken care of, it's nice to sort of get the sun when you want it, but not too much sun. Okay, same thing is true of buildings. If you sort of think about what's going on here, we often sort of talk about things in terms of the temperature and that being the big concern, but never forget the effect of the sun, because the sun has, you know, it's this two-sided thing. On the cold winter day, you really like the sun because it's warming you up, but on a hot summer day, you're really not liking it. And even on the coldest winter day, a, you can still get to have too much sun. This is going to sound really counterintuitive, but there are many, many buildings, because of the way the glass is all over the southern side, we're running the air conditioning on really cold days. And the reason we're doing that is that the sun is just building up inside heat, inside the glass, and you need to dispense with that heat. And what we should be doing is just taking it out directly, as opposed to trying to air condition it away, but a lot of systems aren't smart enough to do that, so they run the air conditioning. And you have these really kind of weird building systems that have done a good job of sort of compensating for all that. Okay. What are some of the other natural forces? Okay, we're going to get you through the night here. Okay. So what else is going to get to you as you're hanging out here? Like, what, what else do you need? Go to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> we do need some sort of sanitation. Okay. I'm not sure what we're going to do about that naturally. We could dig some sort of a pit latrine or something like that. Yeah. How about on the consumption side? How are you doing on water? How, how long can you go without water? Three days. Is that true? Wow, that's really good. I didn't know the answer to that. Food. That's really, really? That's you can good. You go without food, but I think three days is about what you can go on. Really? That's good to know. <laughs> that's good. Okay, 
So, well, hmm, we have a lake right over there. That might be able to help, but what else can we do? A lot of sites don't have a lake right there, so how can we get some water to take advantage? Rainwater. Ah, I like the idea of rainwater. Yeah, so we could go through and say maybe on top, we can collect some rainwater here. We could even do something on the ground. We have some sort of rainwater collection. Okay, rain is very good. But if you're up in San Francisco, there's a really cool system that people work on in San Francisco. What does San Francisco have going on every night during the summertime? They have a very dominant force that if you're up there, you see it rolling into the Golden Gate. Fog. Fog. Yeah, fog's another kind of incredible force. They've done some really interesting work to show how you can actually crystallize water out of fog. It's really kind of cool. Even rainwater is kind of good. What's even kind of cool with just the dew point and the temperatures and stuff like that. Have you ever seen one of those things where you have a little tent and you set it up just right so that basically collects water at night? Yeah, it's yeah. amazing what you do just sort of get water out of just the temperature change because the humidity in the air as the temperature drops is going to crystallize out so you get some water. So you can, you can find a way to collect that in a pretty good shape. So the point of all this, besides you know, sitting you out there suffering for several days, is really just to start to think for any site, you know, what are the problems you need to deal with? And the funny thing about this site, you're a little, you want to keep warm. I'm actually sure the same way. You see, I always wear sweatshirts and stuff like that. In summer, I'd probably get along just fine. I probably would never need air conditioning, stuff like that. But if you really thought about your site and you said, what if I didn't have power and I just had only natural forces to take advantage of, could I survive? And if you can engineer your way out of that naturally, okay, before you start throwing a lot of power at the problem, you probably have a better solution because you have a sustainable solution. That solution will work day after day, year after year. So the whole thing about necessity being the mother invention really sort of works. So start there. Even as we start designing buildings, I'll advise, you know, one way to think about it is, if I said that you could have glass, but glass was gonna cost you like a million dollars a square foot or something like that, and so you had to use it very judiciously, okay? You'd start designing your building very carefully. You know, you'd still have shading, we could block the wind somewhat, but glass is kind of a funny thing. It makes us a little bit lazy because it sort of invites the natural forces, but then puts up this weird, funny barrier. So just always be thinking about the natural forces and what you can take advantage first, and always try to do that because that'll be a better sustainable solution. Okay. Long before, see, we, we don't have any wind turbines or solar panels or ground source heat pumps yet. We're just working with natural forces. So start there. Okay, let me pop out of here. Close up Google Earth for a second. I love Google Earth. It's like, it's amazing to actually go in any place on the Earth, just sort of see what it's like to be around there, stuff like that. It's good to imagine things. So <laughs> the point is maximize the natural forces. Yeah. The sun <laughs> offers all sorts of things for us. The sun has all sorts of potential for like daylighting. It'll help us offset our electrical views through windows and skylights. Thermally, we can collect an awful lot of good energy from the sun, working with our windows. You know, we need to go on this and allow the energy in. We also need a way to collect the energy, which is why we get into thermal mass and floors will absorb it. In the winter months, it tends to be good, but in the summer months, it tends not to be so good. So we need to come up with some strategies for working with the sun so that Physically, we allow the sun during the winter, but we shield it during the summer. And that sounds kind of weird, but it's certainly possible. There's a lot of good strategies we'll talk about for that. We can get into photovoltaic panels or even heating water through the sun. The wind is another natural resource. We don't spend nearly enough time talking about, but its ability to kind of naturally ventilate things is super. We can power turbines. It's cool by letting the breeze blow through things or some really cool technology, old technologies. People hear swamp coolers and you wonder what that is. And it's really, it's just uh, like an evaporative cooler. It's, you just basically have water blowing through air or water, uh, air blowing through water. It's kind of trickling on down. But what happens is as the warm air blows through the water, it actually cools the air. 
okay? Because a lot of the energy goes from the air into vaporizing the water, okay? So it's cooler on the other side. It's a swamp cooler, which sounds like, how primitive is that? It's actually incredibly effective. So everything old is new again. So we're going back to what everyone did 100 years ago because they were actually pretty smart. They didn't have a lot of electricity to work with. On the rain side, we could recycle our water for our toilets as we do here for irrigation, or we could recharge the groundwater with it, which is certainly something we can do around here these days. And the ground is this incredible source of heat. We can use it during the winter time to go ahead and pull up some heat that we would like. If we just either run water pipes through or even air pipes through the ground and we allow either that water or the air to heat up to that 60 degrees or so, you're already so close to the temperature you need that you have to add very little to it to actually bring it up to the real comfort temperature you want. In the summertime, it's fantastic as a sink. Actually, Hong Kong is a fascinating place to me because, yeah, there, okay, how, how does the air conditioning happen in Hong Kong? You know? I learned a little about this. I yeah? It tends to be pretty warm and muggy there a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. What they do, I often talk about the ground being a great heat sink. They use the harbor oh. as a heat sink. So there's pipes that actually go out from the city under the harbor because it actually stays very cold in that water. So in the same way you could run pipes through the ground, you could run it into like cold water, cold bodies of water, and that chills it too. So there's all sorts of chilling sources. Yeah. Whatever's around, you gotta look around. Uh, we can burn the ground, <coughs> burrow, get underground, all these different things. Okay, so just as we get going on your building design, we're gonna start thinking always to, you know, before we throw a lot of power at it, just think about the natural affordances. Okay, enough of that. Let's talk about how you can actually find out about the natural affordances of your site. It all starts with planning. Start with planning. There are many different tools that we use to help give us some information. And really the point of all of this is just really good information to inform you about what's available in the design process. So the ones we'll look at probably more than anything I'll think to begin is Foreman and Revit as two different tools that offer a lot of things. So there's some specific add-ins to Revit, there's Rebuilding Studio, Ecotech, eQuest, there's a lot of different tools that are available. Interestingly, it's all the same basic information that's being used. It's all presented in different sort of interfaces because there is data which has been collected. There are these climate files which exist for the temperature profiles in all these different locations, for the wind, for the rainfall. A lot of that information is available to you. So you just have to go to it and kind of take a look and sort of see what's happening at any individual site to try and understand what's available to you. What I want to do is show you both in format, which seems to be working better today. We'll see if it works on your machines. And in Revit, how we can get some really quick just feedback about contextual information. Okay. So let us start with this if we can. I'm going to go back over to Chrome and see if it'll work for you today. It's working a little bit better for me. I'm going to go to that format360.autos.com site again. Okay. So this is, uh, again, just a website. It's available to uh, just really anyone who has a student ID. Um, at some point, we need to sign you up to get a student ID for the whole Autodesk ecosystem and uh, software. And I'll help you set up that in terms of doing that. Because there's just fantastic tools available out there for you. Okay, so I'm going to say launch. And we'll see. It was working for me just a few moments ago. But again, you know, web-based things you're never quite sure of. Like it was awful last year. It was dead week, and everyone was trying to finish up their projects last quarter, and like a green building studio decided to check out. <laughs> so, like, how nice. <laughs> so, let's see if this is going to work for us today. Give it a try. Okay, see if you can get into, if not, just follow along. Carving those primitives. 
see what she can do. Is anyone coming up, or is it all just like, is everyone sort of getting the big pause? It's slowly working. Okay, we'll see who beats who. He's in! Take it, Gustavo! <laughs> okay, I got in. Let's see who's next. We won't spend too long doing this, but let me kind of show you how this works. Let the Samarvi will kick in now. The idea is, Formit is really, think of it as a very light web-based version of some of the tools in Revit. Everything we do here is available in Revit also, but some things are easier to get to here. So the idea is for any location, we should be able to go ahead and find out some weather information, see what the sun and shadows are going to be like. Um, even sort of start doing some preliminary energy analysis or some solar analysis to figure out how much radiation is hitting the site. And I do it here only because it tends to work easier when it's working. Okay, but we can also show you how you can do that stuff in Revit too. Because it really exists in both those environments. Oh, hey Jacqueline got it too. No Alana, no Brooke. So this is just browser breaks? What's that? This it's is just browser breaks? Yes. Oh, okay. So it all just runs in Chrome. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so some things seem like they're partially working. Let's see how this works. So here's the idea. It always starts with putting in a location. Location is key, whether I'm going to do this in Formit or I'm going to do it in Revit. I say, hey, let's go to some place in the world. Because the movie was a little remote. remote. It didn't sort of understand that very well. How about, oh, let's go for Anchorage, Alaska. Actually, well, we did Singapore, but Singapore, the temperature is so even. You know, Anchorage, Alaska. Okay, I can go zooming on in there somewhere. Wherever that red pin is, where we're going to go through and get some data. So I'm just going to go out here, let's look at the airport or something like that. I'll go to Kincaid Park. I've never been to Anchorage. It's very seaside. It's actually probably a little bit moderate there than if we went out somewhere else. Notice this little guy right here at the airport. That's a weather station. If you click on that, you can find out a little bit about what the temperature profile is. Well, what's happening here? Let's take a look. Yikes. Hang on. i got to see if this is degrees Celsius, or is this uh... Yeah, that's Celsius. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be, gee, it's cold there. So it never gets too awfully hot. In the summertime, it gets up to around 25 degrees. It's about minus 25 in the wintertime. You can sort of see it actually bands together. So sometimes it's pretty narrow in there. It's much more extreme. So we have the min, the max, and the average of those different temperatures. OK, so a little bit of temperature information. That's OK. Let's go on in here. Oh, let's see what else we got over here. You will notice over here on the sidelines, we have a little bit of information about the wind, too. So we have the temperature. But let's kind of go turning over some of these other ones. We can say the wind rose annual. Okay, and that's the annual wind data. So you'll see that what's happening is there's an awful lot of wind that's coming either directly from the south or directly from the north. It's sort of lesser towards the middle. The big extremes on the outside are where the winds are getting very, very strong. But there's definitely this very strong north-south at this location. Probably has something to do with where we're at on this point. Okay? There's also wind coming a little bit from the western side. Very little from the eastern side, though. Probably because there's big hills back over there that are somehow blocking a lot of that. So that's the annual wind rose. 
Now this can be very useful to us is if we are thinking about heating or cooling and we want to use wind as part of that strategy, it's nice to orient the building so that we're catching the wind in the most favorable direction. Or like this might be a really awful place to put like some big old open terrace on the south side because it's going to be so windswept all the time you'd never get the advantage of it. But there's also subwind roses. You can sort of see that during December to February, the winter months, it's classically coming from the northern side. June to August, it's more coming from the southern side. So don't just sort of think the annual wind rose tells the whole story, because it's really different times of the year, you're looking for different times of effects. So the idea that the southern wind is coming in during the winter time or the summer time, <coughs> sort of means that, hey, if I needed to go ahead and try and capture some wind to cool a building, it'd be good to orient the openings towards the southern side to try and capture that. Yeah, it looks like the eastern side is just pretty dead most of the time. Okay, somewhere in between June to August, it's only coming out of that southern side. So <laughs> if you were hoping to get any breezes at all, don't put the windows on the eastern side because they're not going to get any breeze at all. That's not going to help you. Okay. So we got a little bit of an anchorage. Oh, what's another good place? Let's, how about a very hot place? Hmm, what's the hottest place we could think of kind of in the US? Like Mojave Desert or something like that? Or Phoenix is often pretty bad. Yeah. I shouldn't say that. That's one, it's often warm. Oh no, I'll go to Scottsdale. Scottsdale, I was in Scottsdale, down hanging out in Talias in the West. That was kind of a nice place. So here we are in Scottsdale. Let's take a look at what the weather's like there. Wow. Okay, you can see on my balmy summer evening in July, it's getting up to be around well, close to 50 degrees C. <laughs> <You're> like, Yikes! <laughs> and during the coldest of the nights, during the summer, winter time, it's uh, just above zero degrees C, something like that, which is, again, no picnic, but it probably beats uh, being out there. Okay, so I'm building here, okay, do I have a heating or a cooling problem? Yeah, chances I have more of a cooling problem than a heating problem. Okay, and let's take a look at what's going on. So the annual wind rose, interesting, very strong in its orientation. Where's the wind coming from in the wintertime? It's all coming from, or predominantly coming from the northeast. So if I'm gonna have some walls that protect me from the cold winter winds, the northeast corner of the building seems like a good place to try and do something, some landscaping. March to May, summertime. June to August. Okay, coming out of the southwest at that time. So if I have any chance at all of catching a breeze, Okay, I gotta be orienting myself that way. And that's sort of okay. Very often in buildings, think about it. often buildings have both prospect, they look towards and welcome a side, and they have protection, they have a backside, which sort of hides from things. And that's kind of okay. You can start thinking about orienting your buildings that way. I'm gonna do one last thing here, then we'll do our break, and we'll switch over to Reddit. Okay, so here we are in Scottsdale. That's fine. Let me go ahead and on some site that I don't know, I will import a satellite image just so I have a little bit of context and scale. What am I going to do? Let me zoom out a little. Look, a mall. Got a parking lot right there. Check this out. That'll be a garage. It's the side of my new building, though. Okay, I'll import that. In this site, I can start doing things like, oh, just sketching a very basic, sh basic shape of the building. Now, as I do this, and what I'm really starting to do now is what I call conceptual design. I'm not. I really know very little about the building I'm going to design. I'm just really sort of exploring the site trying to get a sense of how big things can be relative to the local streets and context, really what the effect of the sun is, things like that. I'm just going to go through and oh, 
put a building sort of right about in here. Okay, I've sort of sketched the base. I'm going to stretch it up a little. About 40 feet tall. Okay, that's my building right now. Again, not much detail here, but it's something. Let's think a little about just really what we can tell about this building. The last time we showed that you could actually, it sounds very strange, you can already start to estimate what the energy use intensity is. Just based on that, it's a certain number of square feet, it's in a certain location, but just based on these surfaces and the whole notion of the window to wall ratio and the outside temperature and a comfortable inside temperature, and we can make some very high level assumptions and get some very basic data. To do that though, what we have to do is I have to choose this, I have to add a couple levels to it because we need to sort of help it understand is it one big area. So I'll put one at zero, I'll put one at 12, 24, maybe at, yeah, I don't think 36 is right. Okay, super. And I'll go back to <coughs> my project. And say I use those levels. Okay, that's just going to help it in terms of window to wall ratio. It needs to understand there's really three floors there or whatever there is there. Not level four. Okay, so tall, so at least tall there. Okay, we could go through and do some energy analysis. That's that thing that looks like a little 19.1, like a little thermostat. If we go through and run that, it'll. Uh, do some calculations to figure that out. But what I want to show you this time instead is just the whole notion of the sun and shadows. It wasn't working last time, but let me kind of show you how it works this time. We can say, let's choose to show the shadows. And I can do it for any time of the year. It's a very boring building right now since it's kind of very easy to sort of predict what's going to happen in here, different times of the evening versus the morning when you start to see where the shadows are. But one thing that we can do that's actually kind of good is run the solar analysis. Let me show you what that is. This wasn't working last time, that's why I wanted to show it to you today. Okay. I've got this shape over here. You might say, well, how much solar radiation is really hitting this thing? And what can I do about that? And here's what we got to do. We have to select the faces or objects to analyze. So back over here, we just need to go through and select some faces. Right now, it looks like I got all my faces selected. Okay. I'm going to say, do I want to do just the monthly peak or the yearly cumulative? That's going to start to talk about really the whole notion of, are you really trying to sort of figure out how much energy you can collect for solar panels? Or are you really, for a specific month, trying to think about how to do some sort of shading for it, to do some sort of an adaptation of what the window property should be? So I can choose, let me do is do the monthly peak and I'll do it for July right now, so a summertime condition. I'll say analyze. And here's what we can see. If I go ahead and orbit this around, you'll see the roof clearly gets the most energy. And it's interesting in terms of the peak. I'm really wondering why it's purple on that side. That makes no sense to me. That's not what I would expect it at all. Because I think that is being the southern side, and that would be getting the peak. So I'm a little bit strange about that. Let me come back into this. Let me go to the yearly cumulative and see if there's something that I'm just sort of messing up on just because of the monthly. Again, the roof is more. I kind of expect that. The eastern side's not as bad as the southern side. The northern side is clearly the least. Okay, that kind of makes sense. The western side is not quite as bad as the southern side, but it is getting some energy. So you can start thinking about that, and what you can even do is if you hover over the face, you can sort of see what the actual value is, how many kilowatt hours per, what is this case? This is square meter. But the idea with this tool is that you could really quickly say, you know, if that southern face is just looking a little bit extreme in terms of the energy values, what I might want to do is try changing the profile of that face. For example, I could do something like 
let me pull out the face, this is making more of what I'll call a self-shading building, where depending upon the, how the angle of the sun is in the sky, that might be enough to actually completely shade that. And you're going to find this is a little bit different again in different parts of the world. If you're in Singapore and you're at one degree latitude, the sun pretty much is up and down most of the time. Whereas if you're if from in extreme cases at you know, very high or very large latitudes or very low latitudes on, it makes a difference. It's not the same. Let's come back over here. Do my solar analysis. And I'll choose all my faces. And see, just by introducing that little bit of a change there, I've actually reduced the sun that's on here almost to exactly the same as on the northern side. Now, what's the point of all this? The point is that just by changing the shape of that, we actually have probably a better result on the energy use than putting the highest performance quadruple glazed windows in there or something like that. You know, it's just something as simple. If we can use the natural shape and the geometry to work with the sun or shield from the sun, you know, forget the air conditioning, forget the shading, we could actually go through and make a huge impact. And that's what we want to start thinking ahead to in terms of doing something like this. It's just really, you know, if I want a lot of heat and warm, let me get a surface that's actually gathering that heat and warm. Okay, if I don't, let's think about how we can go through and shield from it, stuff like that. Okay, beauty. Let us take our break now, if you can. Come on back in five. Okay, and what we'll do is I'll show you a little bit of the sort of same operation in Revit, because it sort of works about the same way in Revit. Okay, and you can start in uh, Formula 360 and start doing some exploration there, or directly in Revit, whichever you prefer. Okay, but then I want to talk about your projects. I want to talk about the Sustainable Center and what you guys are thinking about doing with projects. And, uh, Kind of just give you some guidance about how to think about that. Okay, so come back in five.